All right. Good morning, everyone. We've reached the uh, prescribed time. We'll go ahead and call the meeting to order. And uh, of course, if I had the right agenda in front of me, that'd be helpful. All right. Uh, first off, we'll go ahead and uh, go around the room and do our introductions. LaVon Daniel, Danco. Paul Avila, Paul Avila and Associates. Rita Lou, Fratech International. John DeWitt, J.E. J. E. DeWitt Incorporated. Bill Lamar, Executive Director of the California Small Business Alliance. David Rothbart, Los Angeles County Sanitation Districts. Good morning, Eddie Marquez, Roofing Contractors Association. I like how you sit over there, Eddie, so you have your own microphone. It's a good idea. And one that works. Yeah. Nancy Feldman, Council's Office. Ben Benoit, AQMD Board Member, Vice Chair. Saad Karam, uh, AQMD Information Management. David Ono, South Coast AQMD, Engineering and Permitting. Hi, good morning. Uh, Carlos Rodriguez, Yorba Linda City Council. Very good. I see one more member joining us. Want to do the introduction roll call? Uh, Jeff Blake with the Metal Finishes Association. Very good. That brings us to our, uh, our one action item. We have the uh, minutes from the June 14th meeting. Anyone have any questions on the minutes? If not, I'll look for a motion on the minutes. Uh, Bill Lamar making the motion. Uh, who wants I'll to make speak? a motion. All right. Second. Oh, I have a question. Paul? Um, Second. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. We already got that. I'll abstain since I wasn't at the meeting. You don't have to. All right. With that, will uh, any uh, anyone uh, with the, move, the minutes uh, any opposed? All right. So ordered. So then on to our review of follow up action items. Any have questions for or any follow up action items, Rita? Um, yeah, just uh, I know Derek's not here, right? <laughs> uh, but I just wanted to follow up on my request for the uh, presentation. Um, on Rule 219 outreach to the uh, printing community, and that was committed to by staff as part of the, I believe it was the 2016 219 amendment. So I look forward to that presentation. A few of us do. Do we know where Derek's at, or when he's going to be here? Okay, thank you. You might have forgotten about our meeting. Um, all right, well, with that, uh, Rita, we'll get back to you on that one. And any other questions or follow-up or action items? All right, with that, we'll go into the uh, first discussion item, the fiscal year 2019 general fund balance uh, update. Sujan. Good afternoon, Chairman Benoit, members of the committee. Good afternoon, Sujata Jain, Chief Financial Officer. and. Okay. Thank you. Um, so this presentation is on our general fund 1920 budget, and I'll go through a summary. And in that summary, I'll uh, talk about revenues and expenditures and a five-year projection and also uh, amendments to Reg 3 fees. So this is a summary of our 1920 budget. And uh, there's a comparison with our previous years, which is 18-19 budget, which we just closed, and we are, you know, com still uh, compiling all the numbers. But it was a balanced budget at $162.6 million revenue and, and expenditures. There were amendments throughout the year, and we estimate to end the year by using uh, $5 million of our reserves. But this is a preliminary number, as I mentioned. We are uh, in the process of closing the year and we'll have a better number in a couple months. So 1920 budget is also a balanced budget uh, that the board passed in May, and it's a $170.9 million budget. So this slide is showing uh, efficiency, and we are comparing our 1920 budget to the 91-92 budget, and you can see that 91-92 budget was a $113 million budget, and uh, the 1920 budget is 171 approximately uh, budget. And there's an increase of 51%, but when you adjust it for inflation, we're still down by 12%. Uh, 
uh, this chart is showing revenues by major activities, and we spend, um, we receive 60% of our revenues from uh, stationary sources, such as uh, we receive emission fees and annual operating fees and permit fees. So those make up 60% uh, of our budget. And on the expenditure side, similarly, we spend almost 65% of our uh, expenditures on core activities, such as uh, permitting, compliance, and uh, monitoring. And if you add in uh, programs and tech advancement, we spend almost 87% of our budget on those activities and 13% on operations. So this is a slide on our um, five-year projection. And in this, there's a couple of things going on, and I can talk to that. First of all, the projections uh, already include a CPI fee increase of 3.5% on our um, permits and annual operating, et cetera, all our fees. And then this is the last year of the Title V fee increase that the governing board approved in 2017. And uh, also we have projected our increase in retirement costs that SP Sarah gives us. And on the salary side, we have increased the salary uh, increases that the governing board approved. Also the reserves, the governing board policy is to keep them at 20% uh, of uh, revenues. So you can see in the first few years we are at or above 20%. And then we do go down, but um, you know we have demonstrated that we can manage that because we did a look back of how we would end 18-19 uh, if that was the fifth year. And we, you know, we were below 20%, but as you can see, we, uh, we can maintain that at 20% or above. And uh, this last slide, I have, uh, the, it says proposed amendments, but of course the budget passed, so it's uh, amendments to Reg 3 fees. And uh, so the CPI uh, increases at 3.5%, and the last year of Title V fee increases, as I mentioned. There are administrative updates with no fiscal impact, and uh, there is a bullet point uh, that I want to just say that the toxics fees did get passed in June, so um, just to make a note of that. And so with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Any questions, Rita? Thanks, Sujata. Just a quick question. You mentioned the uh, board policy was to have 20% for the reserves. So did the board change that policy? Because I noticed the reserves went down, or how does that work? So, Rita, the policy is at 20% uh, of, re uh, you know, revenue. That should be our reserves. And um, the re reserves are going down, meaning you, in the fourth and fifth year. So, uh, like I mentioned, it is very far, and to then say that we want that also to be 20%, sometimes, you know, we have... Uh, expenditures such as the building, et cetera, that are costly expenditures that might have been pushed in those years. And also we managed that uh, fifth year because we did a look back of 1819 to see that when that was the fifth year, what were we projecting? And we were below 20%, but as we get there, we do get to be 20% or, you know, thereof, so. So I guess my question was on a broader issue of if the board has a policy of the 20%, um, does the board adopt a new policy or just with a new vote approving the reserves at a lower amount than 20%, is that sufficient? Is that how it works? So as long as we can demonstrate that, you know, we have enough or sufficient reserves, I think the board is satisfied that, you know, we'll be able to manage it. And so then, yeah, they don't need to change the policy every year. It, it should be the same thing as, the, you know, the opposite were true. We'd have to change the policy because we're at 30% this year. You, you just, you're aiming for that 20%. It's not necessarily we're going to get there in the first year or in the last year. So it's just, it's our goal. And I think as a board, we would look at that. So, Paul, you have your card up? <clears throat> Sujata, I have a question for you. Yes, Paul? With the, with the, and, and I, I'd like to, to extrapolate for me, with the proposed tax increase that's going to come around the corner, if, and if, if, and purely big if, it, it's a, it passes, 
and that revenue comes into AQMD, will that be segregated in a separate fund or thrown into the general pot? Um. So if I could just, before she answers it, all right, fire away, Junior. There's no tax around the corner. <laughs> okay. So I don't I want propose to. Extrapolation, I said, yeah. And there's the bill that we have to create the voting district for there to be a ballot measure okay. for the, um, if there was someone or the board were to put a, an initiative on the ballot, okay. that authorization to create this voting district is also um, pushed. Right now the, uh, the bill got pulled by the uh, author, Senator Ben Allen, and oh. so it's essentially a two-year bill right now. Right. Probably will not be taken up until um, January of next year, oh, and it's got a, a very short window to get out of House of Origin, which is a Senate. So with by the end of January, I believe, the bill has to be out of House of Origin, okay. and if not, then it fails. It still has to go to appropriations. Sure. It still has got to go through the committee process. So <laughs> we're, we're down, we're, it's, re realistically speaking, I don't see how we make 2022, or 2020 ballot, because okay. we still have a long process to go. We still got to, we still got to get past step one, which is creating this voter district authorization. So, uh, so get Thank you. Bill? Yeah, I, <clears throat> I just want to correct Eric. Uh, there are taxes right around the corner. Just it doesn't happen to be yours, that's all. Uh, oh, he's, <laughs> he, I was assuming he meant ours. And, <laughs> and, and, and we hope it stays that way. But... Uh, the, uh, uh, for the record, uh, the uh, alliance members had, had, had no problem with the CPI adjustment to us. It's like business as usual, <clears throat> as long as we stay somewhere between two and a half, three and a half percent, something like that, that we don't get into inflationary. But uh, my, uh, <clears throat> we were talking about uh, your prudent reserves of 20%, that, that's not a hard number, and it sort of fluctuates, I know, from being on the budget committee, but, <clears throat> but uh, I, I understand that the, the district has a problem, uh, an ongoing problem with recovering funds from the state to fund AB 617. Uh, it's, it's a slow process, sometimes agonizingly slow, does that cause you to dip into your reserves at time, or has it <clears throat> in the past two years, year and a half? So, um, so Bill, um, we we started AB six one seven. You know the process, and the money did come. Uh, the the first allotment did come in uh, last June, ten point seven million. So. In a way, you could say that, yes, we were, you know, you, district was using its own money. Um, so you're making bridge loans to yourself or something like that? Well, it's an operating, you know, uh, grant. So, of course, if the work is getting done, uh, staff is getting paid. We did hire many positions for the AB 617, um, you know, grant. So, yes, in, in a sense, we do. But... We do get that money. We have gotten the second allotment too. So it's like, you know, the work goes on and then the money is coming and you know, we account for it. I think, I, I think what you're asking, Bill, is do we pay ourselves back out of that general fund or whatever fund we're using for right. expenses? Right. And yes, we do, and we right, do. Mr. Johnson? Yes. yes. And, and you're losing a certain amount of interest in that time, though, too, then, right? Um. I mean, it's it's. Uh, I mean, if you got a million dollars or something that you need to come up with, uh, and you're out for right. three months. I, I mean, ideally, we would like court. the state to just give us the money, and you know, because the work is going on. But. Um, but yeah, I the think, state's slow to pay. My city waited eight years one time, so we, we, <laughs> and we didn't even get the payment back. Uh, and, and the other thing, Bill, too, is when you think about interest in uh, state government or you know, government agencies like ours, the amount we earn in a, a, a what is considered a safe account that we can keep our money in is almost nominal. It's, you're not losing a whole lot in that. So, at least from my experience in my city government and other county agencies, you just you're just not earning anything. Like a if you were a normal business and you knew you were going to put that money away for three years, you could lock into a CD. Great. 
you know, even then it's what, 3% right now for most CDs, but yeah, but state government doesn't allow that. That's, that's too risky. <laughs> so <laughs> you imagine uh, we're getting more like a half a percent or a percent at that. So it's really not a big impact. Councilman Rodriguez. Uh, yes, thank you. I uh, just wanted to clarify in your presentation, you referenced a um, draw on the reserve of $5 million. Yes. Can you clarify? Uh, so that was for the, the last budget. And yes. can you can you clarify what um, the the main uh, reason for for that um, yes. additional funding needs? Yes. Thanks. So um, throughout the year, so of, of course the board passes a budget, but throughout the year, the dis, uh, you know staff goes to the board to ask for appropriation for various reasons. Um, I think uh, we asked uh, throughout the year uh, to draw from the reserves for. Things like um, there were, let me, let me look at it because I do have some. Was the elevator project one of the items in there? I think? <laughs> That's coming out of oh, this year. Go. And uh, I think one of the biggest ones was we had to go back to the board because we, when we did the balanced budget, we went mid-year to ask uh, to get back some of um, the things for capital outlays, um, our vacancy rate. We wanted uh, to bring that down. Uh, also, we asked for, um, th there was some permit automations. There was a project for that. We needed about 600,000 for that. Um, we had to uh, ask for money for, actually the elevators too. We asked $1.7 million because our, elevate, our building is overall aging and so we need uh, some money set aside and you know we, we will propose in this year's mid-year mid budget to try to put some money aside for uh, repairs, major repairs to the building. So the elevators cost about $1.7 million. So some of the, those are the bigger items. There's some IT type of uh, costs also that we needed money for. All right, thank you. All right, with that, I think we can move on to the next item, the permit streamlining efforts. David? Thank you for your presentation. So now, Carlos, you get to see some of the where we spent some of this money when we talk about the backlog reduction here. Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is David Ono, I'm senior uh, engineering and permitting manager uh, with the district. Uh, uh, I wanted to go over a little status update on where we are with what we call our backlog reduction effort and some uh, and a, a tool that we're developing to help us try to maintain uh, our pending application uh, levels. So as a <clears throat> background and a reminder, uh, in 2016, uh, there was an effort initiated to try to reduce our pending application inventory and cut it in half. And uh, we, we did that a little bit ahead of schedule. And as you can see, um, uh, we're, as we're trying to maintain it, what we consider to be a sustainable uh, inventory level, it's kind of leveled off a little bit. Um, and we're looking at ways to make sure that we maintain that, that sustainable level and then look at ways to, to make our operations even more efficient, uh, considering that there are some headwinds that we're approaching with the upcoming sunset of reclaim and the way our, our, our staffing is, uh, we have an aging workforce and we're having increased uh, turnover. So uh, we're trying to make sure that we have our, proceed, our business processes in place uh, to ensure that we can maintain our current levels. So the tool that we're looking at, we're calling it a um, uh, pending application dashboard. Uh, the concept was originated um, actually through the governing board, uh, giving us direction to look at where people from the outside can take a look at applications that are pending and see whether there's a green, yellow, red light condition, whether or not the application is stuck or not, and an indication of how long that application has been in process to give a heads up in terms of how much longer it will take to be processed, as well as to determine if there's an action that's required uh, to get it unstuck. Um, the way we're planning on, um, on, on releasing this is through the find application 
where you can go through find and find you know facilities or applications directly. Uh, our new find upgrade that was uh, put out earlier this year uh, has a different interface, so, so that's kind of a screenshot of that. You can see it uh, on your handout. And when you go through find by facility, it'll pull up, there's a section there for equipment list, and that lists all of the, the permits as well as pending applications that are associated with that. And by going through that interface, it will then get you to our, our dashboard. So before I get to the dashboard, I want to kind of give a little explanation, maybe a high level uh, perspective, a high, high 10,000 foot view of how our permitting, uh, how my per permit process works. So from an applicant's perspective, um, especially a new applicant, they just may be familiar with they submit it. And at some point, they'll get a permit. They may have a conversation here and there to clarify some information. But behind the scenes, uh, after submittal, it goes through uh, a few steps. We have a pre-screening where we make sure we, the information that we get is complete. Then there's various evaluations that occur. There could be par public participation if there's a public notice required. And there may be other agencies involved if there's a CEQA or if it's a power plant project, for example, the CEC gets involved. EPA may get involved, it's a major source. Um, so there's a lot of back and forth behind the scenes and uh, what I kind of try to show here is that, you know, the applicant may not be familiar with these multiple steps, uh, but they just know that hey, it, it may take longer. Some applications are quicker because they don't have these additional reviews and some take longer. And we're trying to find uh, a better way to categorize that by, by using this tool to then create uh, different buckets so that we can look at applications and say, okay, these are streamlined, these are more complicated ones or complex ones, and the applicant then has a better idea of how, how much more, uh, how much in advance they should prepare their application and make sure that they have all the information they need so that it, uh, it can be more smooth. Um, the, the benefits uh, that we, we anticipate for use of this tool, um, the first one is, you know, obviously we want to check the box and meet the, the governing, board, uh, governing board's direction. Uh, but we want to look at how we can benefit internally, not just providing a tool for the outside to look at our applications to see where they're at, but to look for opportunities for improvement. And by, uh, by tracking each application and identifying areas where uh, the application may be stuck for either internal purposes or if there's another agency, we can categorize those and then group them and then find out ways to streamline the various business processes that govern each one of those activities. Um, and so the, another benefit is once we go external with this dashboard, people can go directly to that to find out where their application is at, um, either even a community interest group, if they're looking at the surrounding areas, they can see what's, what's going on. And it could alleviate some of our public records request information that uh, where there's general information It'll be readily available to them. They won't necessarily have to go through an engineer and have some callbacks, making sure they get the right person. That that takes an extra time, so it'll be quicker there and alleviates some of our staff time as well. And again, the part that we're excited about is once we get good data, enough data in there to do some trend analysis, <clears throat> we anticipate being able to identify uh, additional policies that can we can implement to streamline our business practices. So there's two main indicators that we're putting on the dashboard. <clears throat> I'm highlighting here before I get to the actual look of the dashboard itself. There's a time elapsed indicator. That's just a straightforward one counting the number of days since we received it or some, from, the, from the time that it was uh, deemed complete. Uh, the deemed complete date is when after we finish our pre-screening process and we're sure that we have all the information we need to proceed. Then the second indicator is one that indicates whether or not the application is uh, so-called stuck. And it could be stuck for a number of reasons. It could be something that we're waiting for an action on the facilities part. An example could be like uh, they need to do a source test and we need to make sure that source test is completed. An action on our part, once, once we receive that, we have to review it. And what we're trying to do is track um, actions that occur outside of the direct staff engineer's time. He may need to send the tour source system division and get that back, but it's, uh, it's on us. It's on, the, it's on the district. It's awaiting a district action, and we highlight those with a different indicator. So there's like a, a on or off. Uh, if you can see on the handout, probably easier to see. There's a little facility icon. There's a little uh, district logo icon, and uh, a little person at the desk indicating that uh, the, the application is in process. Uh, at the bottom on the slide there shows what we call like the key milestone 
progress bar because a lot of our terminology is esoteric. Um, these are the key milestone points. We receive it, uh, it gets assigned, maybe a permit to construct is issued, and if there's a, then, then after that there would be a, a permit to operate. So as, as we, the application gets through the process, each one of those will, will light up and they have a date associated with that. Um, just to reiterate, this is the, the high level view, whether it's on or off, you can see the, the grayed out uh, on the right hand side of the status indicators <clears throat> on the left. If it's awaiting particular action, then it's uh, highlighted. Um, I put this information out there just so you understand the deeper dive that, that occurs. Um, it may be stuck, but you wanna know why. Uh, the way that the dashboard is laid out, there's like an upper half and a, and a lower half, and you have the high level uh, indicators up top, and then a detailed diary that shows every action that's occurred within our data system, as well as those that uh, engineer will put in to indicate whether or not we feel it's uh, stuck. Question. Dave, David, I have a question for you. Let's say it's not a controversial project. It's not a landfill, and or it's not a power plant, or the other, which I totally get it as far as time concern, the public, and all that. Let's just say something, some plain vanilla thing like a gas station, okay? And and the the earth's been done already. What's a ballpark process from day one, from the time it's completed? There's no controversy to the time they get a permit on an average. On an average. Okay, for a gas station, uh, as long as it doesn't trigger a public notice. Um, we actually have developed an online tool where you can process that permit within an hour. Um, we, we have rolled that one out. You can go online and do it, but if it is within so much uh, proximity to a school, then it's gonna require a 30-day notice. And if it's, uh, the emissions are high enough, it, it might require additional review you know, for, for toxics impact. But uh, a lower level, um, as you call run of the mill, um, they can do that online uh, currently. Uh, it take about an hour if, you, if you're eligible to do it online. I, th I think you're talking, Paul. You're talking about it from submittal of application till it's approved. Till so. right, right. Not not ev that not everybody is using that. It's uh, we roll that out and we're looking for volunteers to to use that. We we processed a few that way, and yeah, that's about an hour. But if they do it paper route on for a gas station, that's a pretty um, quick turnaround. Um, I don't have the exact numbers in there, but I'm sure it'd be less, less than a month for most of them. We go ahead and we'll hold the questions unless it's related to something on the actual slide until the end of the presentation. Okay. <clears throat> I, I'm just going to give the highlights then. On If it's awaiting a facility action, it's typically because there's information that's missing or, or information that we need. A lot of applicants may not be familiar with air quality impacts, and so they may neglect to submit certain information, so there's some follow-up there. Uh, or if there's an action required on their part, maybe they didn't pay the right fees because they didn't look it up properly, there might be emission offsets required. I mentioned the CEQA. And if it's a permit to construct going to permit to operate, really we can't issue the permit to operate until it's constructed. So that's an action on the facility. And then on the right is the more detailed description. For, um, for South Coast AKMD action, pending actions, um, as you saw from the overview of the permitting process, there's a lot of steps involved to evaluate and ensure that compliance before we can issue a permit. But the main buckets are, we do an evaluation, a lot of it is toxics driven, we might need a field evaluation source test. And then there's processing uh, uh, steps that occur. Uh, in some cases, it's a big project, there's multiple equipment. So you may have finished it for that one application, but there's associated equipment that needs to be looked at. That's uh, what we call like related equipment processing. So we'll highlight that just so the applicant knows that, um, you know, maybe that one particular piece is ready to go, but there's more work to be done. And there could be coordination with other agencies. We, we, we uh, decided to put those all as pending AKMD action because from the applicant's perspective, it's, it's waiting an agency. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take the, 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 the hit on that one, so to speak. If it's waiting EPA, we'll mark it as a waiting AKMD action. Um, <clears throat> again, I apologize for the uh, uh, granularity of that, but uh, on the handout, you, I'm sure you can see a little better. But uh, the, the part that should pop out is on the right-hand side. Those are the two indicator uh, area. So the upper right is the boxes where you have the three little uh, icons there. In this particular way case, the middle one is, is highlighted. That's indicate that there's a facility action required. And on the bottom, there's a, a, a time gauge with the number of how many days have elapsed. 
In this particular case, uh, a permit to construct was issued. Uh, that's why the, it's, uh, it's kind of pegged out um, because it already met the first milestone. And then, so uh, there's some other additional details as generic information that's already available through FIND, including like the contact person's name, the type of equipment, uh, and the uh, certain uh, dates that are in there. And the bottom half is where we have the milestone tracking progress. That's the horizontal um, uh, in, up at up the top of this particular slide. And at the bottom is a lot of the detail information if uh, someone wants to see. And we, we were, for full transparency, we're including everything. Every single system-driven status is, is in there, including the ones that an engineer may add uh, separately to indicate whether or not something is stuck. So um, our expectations is that this dashboard tool for an external Vero, Vero gives them a quick visual feedback on whether or not the application is currently in process or whether it's stuck. And also gives an idea of how long it's been with, that, with us in the system. And if it's stuck, it gives an indicator if it's waiting for something for the facility, so it's a reminder. We, I mean, there's conversations back and forth with the permit engineer, but um, it also gives a, a sense if you have a corporate level and a site level or a consultant, uh, rather than making a bunch of phone calls and emails, they can go quickly there and say, okay, well, there's something that they're waiting on us for or waiting on them for a certain thing, and they can see pro process, progress as it's occurring. Um, the other main expectation for us is that as we get more data and as we go through our, our data quality uh, to make sure that the, it's consistent because we just rolled it out and we're starting to input information in there. So we want, we, we're getting some initial feedback from our engineers on how they want to portray the, uh, the information and, and make it consistent, we're going to be able to uh, identify additional opportunities to, to streamline our processes. And um, um, some of the things that we put out kind of before this tool is uh, we updated some of our policies and procedures, uh, one of the main ones being our, our uh, source testing procedure, where we'll in issue uh, a permit to construct without waiting for the, the um, so, uh, the source has to be completed for rule-driven uh, compliance, but if it requires like for a back uh, assessment or best available control technology assessment where maybe the technology hasn't proven, uh, you know, we'll still wait for that before we can issue it. But those are things that we, we you know, we just inherently knew. As we go through this data, we're going to find uh, certain categories that have longer lead times or longer times where it's in that condition, and we'll take a look at those and say, well, that seems kind of longer than it should be. And then we'll, we'll look at those procedures to streamline those. And those are the things that we're really excited about. Very good. We'll go ahead and go around for questions. John or Bill, whoever was up first there. David, just as a general question, on average, what, how many new applications do you receive annually and monthly? Uh, I think that annually it's about 8,000 uh, a year. So... Um, we divide that by 12. <laughs> I don't have that heavy. Bill? Yeah. yeah. Th thanks, Dave. David. Um, when, I, when I watched this at the last Permit Streamlining Committee meeting, I was a little more impressed than I am now. The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the one icon that, that bothers me uh, is your dashboard in indicator for uh, uh, status indicators. And it's kind of like looking at my car when it says check engine. It doesn't tell me what's the matter. It just says, you know, pull over right away and something is about to happen or, or has happened. And specifically, I'm talking about source test. Uh, we have another backlog. Uh, you know, two years ago, we had the permit backlog. Now you, we, we have a source test backlog. And uh, that's been discussed uh, with the governing board and so on, and the figure 800 comes to my mind. Um, that's where it, where it uh, has the potential to hold up a permit. Uh, the status indicator for awaiting South Coast AQMD action, I guess, would, would, would come up there. But it doesn't say what. And I think it would be uh, very helpful, if, if not almost essential, to have, to have another indicator or maybe a subcategory that says source test. Oh, um, Because you, you guys are, are, for one reason or another, whether it's lack of personnel or whatever it is, are holding up on that. 
Yeah, it, it, it does say that in the uh, on the bottom there in the detail. It might not be able to see it. I know in our public stream lane task force meeting we blew that up so you can. Yeah, it was a higher resolution. I, I can't read. This. I'm but, an old guy. I can't. Yeah, it it, uh, it is included there and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've got them, but they're not helping. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so Bill, what he's showing here, this is the dashboard detail, and it, it stopped right now at, at the first thing there is conduct source testing. So that's the target date. I don't see a close date on that one. Um, but yeah, that particular one, it hasn't. It's uh, there's it's a target closed. date that that's okay. And, and that's I guess I'm, as of I'm, last week. I'm, I'm not talking so much about uh, uh, where, where the where the onus on the, on the facility is to conduct a source test. I'm talking specifically, uh, maybe another category here, about a source test review. In other words, right. balls in your court, right? And that seems to be where the where the hang up is. Facilities, uh, I'm, I'm assuming they they they've, they've got equity in the ground. They want to get moving mm -hmm. on this, uh, but it's it's this long period of time that's holding up uh, the actual issuance of a permit. Uh, and, and that was kind of the point of our our policy to not hold up the permit to construct. Uh, for certain types of source tests that are required uh, because the permit construct serves as a temporary permit to operate. So if it's a rule-driven uh, uh, compliance, then uh, we, we will issue the PC with a, a future date for the, the source testing, and they can, they can operate with the permit to construct. So you'll issue like a provisional or conditional permit? Well, the, the permit to construct is a temporary permit to operate, so they would right. operate under that. Okay, even, even though your review is, is pending on, on the source test? Right. Okay, good. Thank you. Jeffrey? Yeah, on the, um, in general, when people are applying for a permit, uh, they're all going to be filling out 400A, 400 CEQA, plot plan, and then maybe the 14 series. If you could make those available uh, on the computer, on your website, so that they're fillable. That you can actually open them, bring them up on your screen, and actually fill them out. Uh, right now, I think 400A is the only one that people seem to be able to open up, and it make life so much simpler for everybody. If you got those filled in properly by print instead of by handwriting. Uh, number two, on this uh, new 1469 amended rule. We're going to go through this again next year with 1426. Uh, 1469 is going to affect hundreds of shops, and the people are, uh, it's in place now, and the people are sitting there trying to figure out what it's going to cost them to file the paperwork because they have to have the check made out when they show up to the right amount or they can't submit. So the problem is there's been no guidance. Uh, provided to the public on the new amended the amended rule costs, and uh, you know pe people are being referred to Rule Three Hundred One. <laughs> That's like fifty pages of gobbledygook to most small shop owners. Uh, they have no way to guess, you know, what their fee is going to be after they spend a couple hours with that document. So there should be some way, and, and this probably should be something that happens in the future, because we're going to see a lot of amended rules in the remaining years, and it should be some kind of guidance provided uh, directly when the new rule is coming out as part of the uh, promulgation. Any response? Um, with respect to the, uh, the 400 e forms, we're actually uh, on, right in the middle of a project to make all of our forms available online uh, so that you would be able to fill them in and submit them online and not just necessarily in fillable PDF format. Although I think a lot of our forms should be fillable, um, I can go back and check and see which ones are not. Um, but we are moving to an online submittal process. Um, with respect to outreach for new roles, um, I, I would defer probably to our, our role development team, but um, to the extent that we have major roles like um, um, 1147, uh, there's definitely guidance documents that are set up for those, and uh, we can we partner with role, our role development team as their, the role is progressing, and uh, I can in, make sure that uh, we put that feedback to them. Read it. 
Yeah, thanks, Dave. Um, is the dashboard information already available on FIND? Is that incorporated or is that coming up? It's uh, not. It's in our testing environment. Um, we are introducing it to our executive council as well as to uh, a few of our, our um, subcommittees. And uh, we're going through a little bit of data cleanup because some of the terminology that's in there is, you know, it's it, it makes sense to internal people, but once people on the outside see it, there's some, uh, uh, you know, probably some terminology we want to update. So we're, we're working towards Resource Committee within six months of June, so that would be by the end of the year. We'll go back to Stationary Resource Committee with our plan on source testing in whole. These issues you're talking about, permitting issues, et cetera. So we're working on all that now. Uh, I think we anticipate having a first working group within about two months' we'll time frame. Microphone. Thank you for the and that's it. response. <laughs> now that you're on, on the recording. Um, but just to encourage you when it does come up for the working group, since you do have a tool that's very valuable and it's helpful for both sides to keep track of things, maybe instead of creating a new wid widget for source testing, it could be rolled into this so it's easier on, on everybody. Uh, yeah, we're, we've been part of the, uh, the conversation on, on the planning for that. Yeah, I recall uh, some time ago the discussion on 301Y came up 
Um, and I'm wondering if you're still getting a lot of 301Y applications with this new backlog reduction effort. I would think that maybe some of the demand for the 301Y applications has gone down if you're getting these permits out quicker, which is the thought behind the backlog reduction. So what's, what's the update on 301Y? Uh, well, I don't think we've looked at that to see if there's been a, a significant drop off relative to our backlog reduction effort. Um, I think it's more or less kind of the same, the same people who look to use the, the expedited permit processing uh, option are, are continuing to do that. Um, well, we can follow up that to see if there's been a drop off in there, but uh, I don't think there has been. Um, just a quick question. So when you, if I'm a company and I have my dashboard, do I have to go and check it every day or is there a, a, an option to fill in an email form and get an email every time the dashboard has an update so I know to go look at it? Or uh, No, I would say in general, uh, people who are involved with the processing, they're in, in communication with the, the permit engineer already. So they wouldn't necessarily need to, to look at it. It's really more for people that are not directly involved but still interested in the application and they can go in and take a look at it. Uh, right now, again, it's, it's the interface is through fine, so you would know, and you can actually, you know, bookmark that particular uh, application and load it up to see where you're at. Um, we don't have uh, currently plans to do that kind of push uh, communication uh, that that require a lot more maintenance. Sure. Uh, and but as we get more accustomed to the tool, um, certainly there's going to be a, a revision where we'll incorporate some of the feedback as we roll it out. Okay. Governor That's a good Rory, idea, or? though. That's a good idea to, because, you know, there's those systems where whenever a new notification or an update happens, uh, if you're subscribed to the list, you automatically get Yeah, and it might notice. be something even as general as, if, you know, any facility that you're interested in, you could tag that and find and say, I want to be updated every time this facility has a change, whether it's in their permitting or some other thing. You know, I know if I live next door to a particular facility, I want to know when they're pulling a new permit application. But... So that would be a nice way to nice add on at some point, but I understand it is a it is a maintenance headache, especially when they don't get the particular email and they they were expecting it. But so, Carlos. Uh, first, I wanted to commend the governing board and uh, staff for pursuing greater transparency and potential uh, efficiencies. Uh, after it sounded like there will be a time of implementation and then kind of looking at uh, opportunities to increase efficiencies. Um, my um, question is on slide four in your, your presentation, uh, you kind of laid out the permitting process and uh, does the applicant um, have um, any idea of the kind of average amount of time in, in between each uh, of these, just generally speaking, so that they kind of have an idea of what they're getting themselves into? I know if you look at a city planning department, they may say first plan check is three weeks, second plan check is two weeks, third plan check is one week in between. Is there anything like that that is currently available? And if not, is that an option? And uh, also um, the idea of a online submittal process, is that something that this can be bridged to ultimately? Um, thank you. Yeah, what we're hoping to do by, by rolling this tool out and tracking that information is to get good information to, to show particular types of applications and equipment, the historical uh, time period between each of the various steps. Um, because each permit is uh, a little bit different and depends on where they're located and what depends on uh, how big the facility is, um, there's, it, it's, uh, right now we couldn't really give those kind of um, generic ballparks. You can give a range, historical range, but it's very broad. So as we get more information and we're able to take a deeper dive and then categorize the different things and the triggers that associate with it, we'll be able to present that information. Um, with respect to integrating with the uh, online um, application, I think that you're asking, um, there, right now there's are separate tools. Um, and, you know, one is the application process, and the, but they, they're integrated in the sense that the information that's used to generate the permit 
uh, that appears in the diary, what we call the diary. That's the detailed information below. So that's already pulling information from the systems that we currently are using. Uh, we're just trying to find better ways to describe some of those steps. Uh, just, um, just a quick follow-up. I know that the county of San Bernardino and uh, cities like Ranch Cucamonga have currently, a uh, number of cities have uh, this technology in place. So um, and I understand it's, it's not cheap. So just uh, has there been already kind of an exploratory um, process on, on that as well? As far as uh, potential cost and, and examples of what an online submittal process uh, might cost and what it would look like? Well, I think in a, quite a few of the different types of permits, we're already down that path. We're already, it is an online process. Great. It just depends on the type of permit. So, for instance, he mentioned the gas station process now. That used to be a paper submittal. Now it's an online submission, and it can be re returned within an hour. So it's really it just depends permit by permit where we're doing that. And Lockheed's charge when he first took this over was, you know, look at the overall holistic, which were the where's the biggest pile of permits and what, what would be the best thing to digitize first? And so how many different permits of the, of the are now, or permit types are online? Yeah, right. Right now we have uh, three modules. So we have for dry cleaners, uh, gas stations, and for automotive repair facilities, the spray booths associated with that. Uh, we have plans uh, for, um, for our registration program to go online as well as the registered equipment uh, to go online. And, and I'll say, Carlos, I recently had an experience at a, uh, a, a civic event here in Lake Elsinore, and I had a gentleman come up to me who has been through the process multiple times for spray booths. He owns about five or ten automotive repair facilities, and his last time he went through it, he, he came up to me and just had to tell me that he was amazed at how quickly his process was done. And for the first time ever, he's waiting on the city to get back to him for their finals as opposed to where he's always been, where in the past he was always waiting for AQMD to get back. So he's waiting in the city like Yeltsin to get back to him, on his, or not, sorry, it was Moreno Valley that his, his new facility was going into. So it's really turned around quite a bit once we can get those different <coughs> processes online. So we are moving that direction, and I applaud you guys for the, uh, the hard work you've done. And it really is letting our business community that wants to operate move forward quickly and, and, and in a good way and getting everything done. So thank you. It's taken us a few years, but we're, we're finally getting there, and it's just it's, it was a monumental task, especially when the department was already so far behind to try and ask them to make changes to, you know, to catch up was difficult because they had to maintain what they were doing and at the same time change a lot of these processes. So really, it's been an amazing uh, monumental move forward for that to all work out. So thank you. Bill, another question? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> David, it, it was your... Oh, there you there go. we go. Your, your recent comment on, on, on the online uh, se industry sectors, and I know I brought in the auto body shops, the dry cleaners, and the gas stations. What would you say your level of activity is? In other words, uh, online filings versus paper filings, uh, um, since you have that. Yeah, it's not as high as we'd like it to be on the dry cleaners. Uh, I think it's gaining some momentum. The other two modules, uh, we, we really need to get more volunteers to participate in that, that effort to make sure that it's uh, you know, working as smoothly and, and properly because that one was rolled out subsequent to the dry cleaner right. module. But, but I've, I've seen the different iterations since you, you started with the dry cleaners, especially the Korean dry cleaners, and uh, yeah, you know it's gotten better. But I think you're also going to need some outreach. In other words, you, you've got to do some marketing for this. Uh, you know, it's not only uh, you know, maybe somebody at the counter or something would say, well, rather than do this, would you go over to the kiosk here, uh, you know, and, and fill your paperwork out, something like that. I, I think you're going to have to be a lot more proactive if you want to turn the corner and, and, and get a, an, an online uh, platform rather than the old manual platform. Yeah, just a quick comment. So following up on, on Bill's um, comments, one of the things that I've heard, one of the hesitations is that the online system, once you're in, you pay up front, and if for some reason the system denies your permit, then there's no way to recoup that money. Whereas if you're interacting with an engineer rather than a computer, um, they could give you the heads up of where it's going and maybe the company has 
some opportunity to modify things or take a cap on you know throughput or things like that. So that's I think that's holding some people back because it's sort of like a gamble. Once you're in, there's no way to back out. That was my understanding where we left off last at the permit streamlining task force. Okay. Okay. Um, I think that that highlights the, our need for outreach because um, that's not necessarily the case. I mean, you pay, it won't deny you, but it will indicate that it will come in-house. So you would still submit online and then would go through the regular route if there's something that's indicated uh, that it may, that compliance could not be demonstrated with the online information. Um, in order to issue a permit automatically, we have to build in some conservatism to ensure that it's compliant for all the rules and regulations. If there's information that, uh, based on our conservative assumptions, shows cannot show that it's in compliance, then we'll come in house and then we'll do a more detailed review of it, and then just the regular process as if you submitted a check with uh, your application. And then your forms are already filled out, so you don't have to write them down again. So. Well. It's not our fault. Right. That's not, uh, that's a, you know, can't fix everything. All right, any other questions? Thank you. Great job, guys. All right, with that, we have our uh, written reports that are attached. Any questions on any of those? Derek, do you have any announcements you want to? Uh, yes. That you missed earlier? Yes, sorry for being late. Um, you already did these or not? I, no, I did not. No. Okay. I want to go ahead and bring those up. So the action items, I'm sorry I missed, I got here late, but action items, the first one was provide Mr. Lamar with information regarding the dry cleaner grant program. We emailed that to you. Done. Check. Uh, second one was provide a presentation on cap and trade program. So we're going to agendize that. That was from Paul. Um, and then lastly was provide information regarding permit backlog reduction, and that was done today. The other thing I'd just like to mention is um, it's that time of the year where we get, we open up for nominations for our Clean Air Awards. So you should all have one of these already. If you have businesses that uh, you would like to nominate or they would like to nominate, uh, just have them fill it out online. This one you can fill out online. <laughs> and submit it, and then um, we'll be glad to um, receive their nomination and consider them for a Clean Air Award. And that's it. Derek, you missed my um, follow-up. Oh, yes, your follow-up. Your um, my long two two one nine. Is it two one nine? Two nineteen. I, I, I let two him know nine. that yeah. you had mentioned that. Already, so. so I yeah, we, we're 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 working on it. All right. All right. Any other matters? Do you have any public comment? Not seeing anyone jumping up. All right. Our next meeting date will be uh, Friday, September thirteenth. So please, no one come here in August. We won't be here. Yeah, it will be dark August, so be here September 13th. Everyone have a great summer.